Good morning, everyone. Uh, just as my slides are being set up, um, I'll start speaking to save some time. So um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to Dr. Somshila Murthy and the entire team uh, at the Dias and at AIOC um, uh, to give me this opportunity to speak. So my topic today is allergic eye disease, and all of us in our OPDs, every day we must be seeing uh, numerous patients who uh, numerous patients who, who present with various spectra of allergic eye disease. So be it a minor itching to the severe uh, shield ulcers, and it's not a case or a diagnosis we can escape in any way. Um, and uh, very often they are chronic, they come uh, almost uh, you know, every week or month, every time they stop the drops, they may have, be having recurrences, and those are the cases that we are trying to um, trying to treat effectively, uh, because we do know that the chronic sequelae of a long-term, a long-standing allergy can be uh, quite severe. In the interest of time, I don't think we'll have questions in the end. So anybody is having any comment to say? Because we are already running quite late. OK, right. back to you, Sharon. OK, so as we were saying, there's a very varied presentation, and it can be chronic or rec uh, recalcitrant. So a few leading questions to try and differentiate what kind of allergy it is uh, are very, very useful. So you have to see whether the patient has symptoms uh, just a few months of the year or a particular time of the year, which would suggest that it's a seasonal variation. Um, or if it's all through the year. So some people may have it, you know, irrespective of the season or whether it's spring or anything. And that would be a more perennial kind of uh, allergic disease. And uh, depending on how they present, we would need to, in the chronic cases, give them some sort of a prophylactic treatment to try and cover them in case they are seasonal. Now, these are the ones which are, can be quite severe. So VKC or vernal keratoconjunctivitis, by uh, its definition or what we learned during our post-graduation were its children, young ad adolescents, more in boys, 11 to 13. But uh, it doesn't often you know, stick to this. So, so don't restrict yourself to this diagnosis. It can be across a quite a wide range. Uh, they may present to us much later. Um, but what you have to remember is that there are two very you know, stark forms, and there may be an overlap there, but a lot of maybe a tarsal form where you have the giant papillae, or a limbal form where you have you know, the horn or or spots or just the limbal thickening. So that's very important that we try to remember these pictures, always evert the lids, even if the bulbar surface is looking quite pristine, it's important to evert and check. Another uh, telltale sign is if you stain, and staining is very, very important again in these uh, uh, children or patients, uh, because you can see punctate erosions, and if you, if, even if it's not clinically visible, always stain, look for the punctate erosions, and then evert, uh, because that's the kind of damage that would be forming on the ocular surface. Another very useful thing about staining is that if to look for the activity of disease, so uh, very often if it's an active disease, there would be dot-like staining on the limbal area or on the tip of the Hana Tranta spot, and you know that it's active disease, even if they may not be so symptomatic. Um, the corneal involvement can be permanent, it can cause severe uh, visual impairment, and that's why it's important to try and prevent it or at least reduce the severity of it. Um, so look for this, and if you see a patient who has a panus, has an area which looks like an old limbal stem cell deficiency, keep them on a closer observation. Always ask for a history of atopy. Uh, they may not be aware of it, uh, so you have to ask leading questions sometimes. So asking them just allergies may not help, but you know, dust, sneezing, uh, skin allergies, skin rashes would help these patients. Um, sometimes you may notice it even if they don't tell that they have these kind of eczematous lesions around their eyes, and uh, very often it may be related to some cosmetics that they may use. It may be related to hair dye. So it's important to check for this, look for it, or some chronic medications that they may use. In children, look for this, what is called a Denny Morgan fold, which is just near the corner of the lid, and it's usually because of a chronic rubbing habit that they may have. So look for these telltale signs even if they're not giving the history of it. Uh, 
Now the clinical assessment is, I'm sure, uh, fairly easy and straightforward for most, so I'm not going to go into detail, but it has to be quite intense. One thing with allergy and that I, I would like to stress is that it takes a lot of, especially for the chronic uh, ones, we need a lot of counseling to explain to them that it's not a one-time thing. There would be uh, long-term follow-up and long-term uh, medications required, even if they are doing well. Otherwise, they only come in when there's an exacerbation. That time, we just have to keep giving steroids, and sometimes they may develop a complication of a long-term steroid. The clinical assessment, again, in addition to the ocular assessment, we need to look, especially in the ones who have a chronic disease or have a history of a systemic association, ask them for any skin lesions that they may have. Always check their vision, because they may also have associated problems, especially in children. If they are eye rubbers and you see a significant cylinder, uh, never forget to rule out an early keratoconus. So there may be you know, other conditions that may be associated that we cannot miss on these uh, patients. Now this is an excellent paper and I'm sure it's uh, available to everybody, um, but it really has made our understanding simpler and our management simpler. But um, just the gist of it is that Everything has a stepwise approach, and you may do a step, step up or a step down, depending on which stage you think the patient is coming in, and it's fairly straightforward. Uh, basically, in mild, moderate, moderate, chronic, severe, or blinding disease, your, you know, the way you treat these patients or the aggressiveness with which you treat them would change. So the findings are given there, but basically in the early stage there's not much, there's just a little bit of inflammation and hyperemia, and as you progress there may be, you know, giant papillae or chronic papillae changes on the cornea, including shield ulcers. So what's in our armamentarium, okay? Thankfully we have quite a bit, but the trick is to know when to use what and how much of it and how long, how long you need to do it so that you can help them without causing side effects to it. So we remember that um, the, you know, this is like the rough pathway of allergy, um, and there's a lot of medications available to us. Uh, in the more severe disease, we would need to use topical steroids. In the chronic or milder disease, we use a lot of mast cell stabilizers, and NSAIs we usually avoid. But in addition to this, we do have a lot. Uh, in addition, the non-steroidal medications have been a lifesaver, and I'll come to it. So what you're looking at to consider while planning treatment is the severity of illness and the periodicity of illness. So if it's an in intermediate disease periodicity and the patient has a significant inflammation-free period, then you can titrate your therapy and it would need only the pulse therapy. Whereas if they have a chronic disease periodicity, then in addition to the pulse therapy, you have to keep them on a long-term maintenance therapy. And that's what we'll come to. So again, from the same paper that we talked about, um, it, it sort of tells you what the findings might be, and this is where the treatment algorithm comes in, where we are talking about either a step up or a step down. So usually if you see a, very, uh, a patient who has a very severe allergic disease at presentation or when you see in the clinic, it is important to hit them hard. So you have to give a high frequency steroid preferably a stronger steroid, and this we are talking of the more severe. So you see a giant papillae uh, conjunctivitis, you see a lot of uh, horn or transport, limbal inflammation. Then the initial treatment has to be strong. A milder steroid may not work, and you want to cut that inflammation. But what would change is how long you use it, so you can keep a very fast taper. Again, if you have a chronic disease, it's important to additionally add on other medications, which would be mast cell stabilizers or non-steroidal medications like cyclosporin or tacrolimus, which have been really invaluable in our practice for these patients. Now, we've already talked about mild disease, and this is where we come into intermediate or chronic disease. So intermediate disease, you give your short pulse of steroid, but in the chronic disease, which we really need to tackle, so a long-term therapy, now, cyclosporin 0.05 and 0.1% is very, very useful in dry eye um, and also in some forms of allergy. But what has really been much more useful is the tacrolimus, uh, which is available to us as 0.03 or 0.1%. Um, and it's, it's much more potent than cyclosporin. It's a one-time dosage usually at night, can be a BD. The only thing you need to remember to tell the patient is that it causes stinging or burning. Otherwise, they would assume that it's a side effect and stop the medication. And usually you need to give it for at least six weeks to three months uh, because it's a slow-acting medication like cyclosporin. 
severe disease, we do not have an option. We have to treat it uh, you know, more aggressively. And as I was saying, we give the steroids and then maintain them. The eversion is at every visit. We do not expect the cobblestone papillae to totally go away. But what happens is that they become less elevated, they become a little more flat topped, that uh, aggressiveness goes away and so they stop abrading the cornea and causing the damage to it. This is just how, so I was saying that cyclosporin 0.05, 0.1% is uh, very good for dry eye, but for allergy, especially severe allergy, we may need a higher dose and 1% cyclosporin unfortunately is not available to us as a commercial preparation, so you can prepare it. Um, again, fairly easy to do um, and uh, very effective for patients. Only thing they need to keep coming to ask for it. So this is between the comparison between cyclosporin to tacrolimus. Um, tacrolimus is much, much more potent and very easily available in case they cannot tolerate it within the eye, even after using just a rice grain amount, and that's what you tell them, then it can be applied on the skin as well. In case you have a blinding disease, then you really need to monitor them for other complications such as having developed a glaucoma or cataract, and that is very important. So this is a patient who had cobblestone papillae and also a shield ulcer, which is very visible there. Um, we had to do a supratarsal triamcinolone injection, uh, which is, again, doable in the OPD. Um, need a little counseling for these patients, and tri tricot is very... Um, it's not at all expensive to the patient. Uh, the only thing you must remember to check is whether this patient is a steroid responder. So if you've put them on steroids before, you should have monitored the pre pressures. Uh, preferably avoid directly giving a, a trims, you know, a supratarsal injection because if the pressure uh, rises up very fast, it's difficult to manage them. Sharon, if we can summarize. Yes, sir. I just want to show this video. So uh, this is how we would deprive the shield ulcer. So fairly easy. You can just do it in a minor OT or in the main OT and uh, you just have to make sure that you get the entire plaque off and freshen up the edges. Now one thing in addition to all of this is sometimes there is a small group of patients who may in addition require a systemic uh, immunosuppression. So that comes in two forms. One is you send them to the allergy specialist who would um, then do uh, pathogen testing. This is not recommended for everyone, but I have found it invaluable in my practice for those who are recalcitrant to all the things that we've discussed before and keep coming back with uh, recurrent episodes. Uh, and they do sublingual immunotherapy, which ha also is very useful for these patients. So this is the pretty much the algorithm which we can follow. Um, so the IgE just a point, serum IgE may not always be risen in these patients, um, so blindly doing it and following that may not help, but along with the other tests for recalcitrant patients, it may be very useful. So thank you very much for a 